Could somebody from the panel just summarize uh, what are the specific uh, problems with Western science accepting the Vedic point of view? <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Shall I start? Um, if I had to summarise it in just, just a few sentences, um, I think the big difference between Eastern and Western views has to do with the history of how um, Eastern and Western cultures have approached methodologically how we can know anything and, and fundamentally the tradition in the West has been to take what we call a third person perspective view on the nature of reality so the idea basically it's a little bit, in fact as Jay was saying you know that we think there's stuff out there and uh, the way to understand the nature of reality is to have a look at this stuff and, and start to break it up, analyse it, work out what its component parts are and so on. And, and in, in, in one or another form, that, that's the way we proceeded. Whereas in the East, they've, they've in a sense taken the same phenomenal world but taken what, you might, what we call a first person perspective view on it all. Both East and West, people have asked themselves the same question, which is, what is the fundamental reality which lies behind the world of appearances? And, and the actual methodology in the East, in my understanding anyway, has been to say, well, um, the world of appearance is, 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 if you like, manifest as a world of phenomenal experiences. So in order to find out what lies behind this world of appearances, let's see what happens when the phenomena fade away and ask ourselves whether anything remains. Is there something constant behind all the change? And if you take a third person perspective route on that, you wind up with, if you like, Platonic universals now expressed in terms of the laws of physics. So maybe there are patterns which you can describe in terms of, shall we say, a grand theory of everything. Whereas in the East, it is once the phenomena are allowed to settle and fade, and you, you, you then try and experience directly what it is like to be in a state that is nevertheless conscious, but not, if you like, distracted by the phenomena, is then expressed as a kind of realization of what that might be like. That, that would be my take on it. If we must not take anything away from Western science, really, I am one of the greatest fans of modern science because through the integrity of science now, we are discovering some of these truths that Eastern metaphysics has been talking about for a long time. They were only accessible to those people who were going for us and meditated. For the majority of human beings, it was no way here. So what Western science has done is through its integrity, through its civil discipline, it is really discovering these truths in the most dramatic manner. The place where Western science begins to show its limitations as one physicist is when you look at the smaller than the smallest, the fabric of reality, things crack up. You begin to see the frail edges of our methodology. Or when you look at the larger than the largest, the cosmological model, or when you look at the complex, it's no longer straightforward, it's non-linear, strictly intertwined. And here again, science begins to show its frail edges. And the fourth place where in dramatic way science shows its limitation is who is the subject. Does this subject object divide has never been fully explored? And what I just said in this my quiver in jelly, which I think everybody seems to like, is that the first quiver that we get is a subject object divide. And now the object becomes existence really, and the subject becomes consciousness. Thank you. 
So the question of uh, consciousness is very important because uh, the principle of the substantial evolution, substantial evolution in the Eastern cultures is based on the knowledge about consciousness. Substantial evolution of what? To answer the question, who am I? Or to answer the question, what is me? What is me? So, in this substantial evolution, there is a goal, there is an objective. And the objective is perfection. What does it mean, perfection? Perfection regards the question of ru'yat. Ru'yat means vision. What is the subject of vision? It is to establish a relationship between individual consciousness and universal consciousness. And what does it mean, universal consciousness? <coughs> So, we are in front of a lot of questions which are posed in the mind of each one of us. Who am I? And what I am doing here? And what is the goal of my creation? What is the objective of my life? Am I am a being like other alive beings? or something else. It is just because of this that out-of-body experience becomes very important. Because when a seeker, a researcher, who is researching an answer for this question, what is me? to differentiate between real me and false me. And to apply the method of the substantial evolution toward perfection. So this person is seeking something. Finally, seeking itself, herself, self. Self is in research of self. It is the self which is searching the self. This is the self which created my body and my brain. It is self which pre-existed me, my body and my brain and my heart. And it is the, I, I am 59 years old. It means that 60 years ago, I didn't exist. And the consciousness started to create me, to create my body, my brain, my heart. And now it is seeking itself. So I am taking distance from the brain. But how? There is a method. So, by the deep meditation, to have what is said, the out-of-body experience. Because during the out-of-body experience, you discover that self is entirely the faculty of hearing without eyes. Totally entirely the faculty of seeing, of hearing, of smelling. My eyes are the continuation of my brain, but self doesn't need any eye. It is the faculty to see. And when you are out of your body, you get this experience. It is 
the name of this experience is dédoublement en français. In French language, dédoublement. When you become two ones. When you observe yourself from your body into the air and when the consciousness is situated on the floating astral body and looking, observing the material body on the bed. The consciousness can be related to the material body and can be related to the astral body, out of body. When you have this experience of the dublumon, you understand that you are neither astral body nor material body. Self is other thing. But only by the experience, by getting the experiences. And after, we are using the scientific language to explain it. It is other thing. Getting the experience and how to explain this experience. So it is important when mysticism and science are going, getting together with each other to search and answer, how to explain. Mysticism is to get the experience, and science is to explain this experience. Um, The question I'd like to ask Hannah is that, uh, why is it that our body is limited to certain uh, it's limited, that means our vision is limited to certain colors, we can't see all colors, why we can't hear all wavelengths, we are limited to certain uh, certain uh, noises and we can't hear everything and also from the kind of uh, uh, when we touch something which is like extra hot or extra cold, we, we can't distinguish between those two, we just feel the sensation of burning. So why do we have these limitations? And uh, or on the other hand, uh, how this capability of our body is being decided? Is there a kind of uh, view to that? Who is that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think, I, I guess, I think the, one of the things to remember is that you know all of our perception is limited even if we're using you know very complex equipment and microscopes or Hubble telescopes you, you know we we have these inherent limitations in our in our ability to to perceive and, and interact with the world what what I do think is interesting is that we we kind of almost have this um, a norm, an average of what, say, people can hear or, or people can perceive, but actually there are always people that are outside those norms, so that suggests that those limitations aren't quite as concrete um, as, as, as they may appear in, in the first place. Yeah, um, I think uh, <clears throat> the simple answer is that on, on this particular question, you know, why are sense organs tuned in, in the ranges that they are, is, is probably a biological evolutionary one. So as having, answered, having asked the question, you will know that um, um, the way sense organs are tuned varies from animal to animal. So some animals have more acute vision than we do, many of them have more acute hearing than we do, Um, nearly all of them have better sense of smell than we do, um, by a long way, and so um, actually this fact was, when I was a teenager, was the fact that got me interested in consciousness to begin with, that I had this sense of being trapped if you like, by the limitations of my senses. And um, I actually built a machine. That was my, my <laughs> that was my 
the beginnings of my PhD that I actually built a machine that would tune me into ranges of hearing that I could not otherwise hear. And I thought, you know, if I explored that, then maybe I'd learn something about 